Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this edition. You're watching Labor Vision, the at-home edition. Thanks so much for joining us again. My name is Erica Hammond. I am your host, and joined with me today is Justin Kelly, a business representative for the Rhode Island Painters and Allied Trades, uh, Local 195 and to District Council 11. Thank you so much for joining us, Justin. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Erica. I'm glad to be here. Um, wanted to, uh, uh, again, just say thank you uh, to yourself and everybody over at the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Uh, for making this possible, and it, it's a great program. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about myself as a place of introduction. Please do. Uh, Welcome back to Labor Vision. Yeah, thank you so much. So I represent um, about 500 members and their families who are part of District Council 11 of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades here in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we represent a variety of crafts, um, and uh, first and foremost, painting, commercial, uh, painting is our uh, primary craft, uh, followed also with some of our other crafts that we represent, drywall finishing, industrial and bridge painting, uh, and glass and glazing work. Uh, we represent some uh, other uh, types of workers, other parts of the country. Um, we have workers at the Providence Housing Authority and at the Rhode Island Turnpike and Bridge Authority that we represent. Um, in other parts of the country, we represent floor coverers, civil service workers, uh, so on and so forth. But here for my organization, um, District Council 11, Local 195, that's uh, what we do and who we are. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Now, can you talk a little bit about the impact that the COVID-19 crisis has had on your members? Yeah, sure. It's, it's been something where, you know, we're, we've not escaped the impact of the pandemic. Um, you know, we've faced it. Uh, even as being classified and termed uh, an essential industry and essential workforce, um, we've it's had a heavy impact on people. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is the safety response uh, from our contractors and membership and the business community that we work with. Uh, and that's by and large been very good here uh, throughout Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Um, you know, in other parts of the uh, area, uh, Boston, Massachusetts in particular, um, you know, construction was shut down when the pandemic mm -hmm. hit. Uh, we were fortunate in that, you know, the construction industry was not shut down by government order or edict. Uh, and that's partially because they know uh, on the unionized side of the industry, where we do the largest, most complex projects that exist, they know that we can take care of what needs to be taken care of uh, in terms of health and safety. Right. Uh, that said, I have members that have uh, not been working because they worked in Massachusetts and Boston. Um, we have members that have not been working locally because uh, they have a situation of uh, health concern for either themselves or their family. Um, maybe either themselves or a family member have a pre-existing condition. Uh, they live with elderly parents or have young children that they're concerned about. And so, you know, we're first and foremost and primarily always concerned with people's health and safety. It's been something where no one has been penalized or looked down upon uh, turning down work in this situation of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen some great work opportunities uh, come out of this where, you know, it's the um, cliched saying of with crisis, there's opportunity. Uh, the field hospitals was one of those and right. really have to give great, respect and commendation to uh, the state, to the governor's office, to the emergency management agency, uh, to the contractors, but first and foremost, our members in the Rhode Island Building Construction Trades and the men and women of the IUPAT who got out there and made the, those projects possible, did what was a month plus worth of work, maybe two months or more in a two week span of time. Yeah, those went up uh, really quickly. Working seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. So it was very impressive. And that's indicative of what the building and construction trades can do and what the men and women, the IUPAT do day in and day out. We make right. what's almost impossible possible and we happen and we make it happen. We execute it safely 
on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. Something too that I, I had learned about that was interesting that I'm not sure if viewers realize as well. I didn't realize that the N95 masks, these are masks that are typically just for um, use on construction sites, right? Um, so now with the large necessity for them, um, there's a shortage of them. Are you finding yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. It was funny because, it, you know, N95 masks, like nobody had ever heard of that. I had, you know, a half dozen of them sitting in my basement, one hanging on my banister, railing to the basement. You know, mm -hmm. we had a bunch in our training facilities. Um, the ones that were open and, you know, already used, I kept for myself and, you know, my wife, uh, my mother's a registered nurse who sent some to her. Um, we donated from our finishing trades, uh, the majority of our personal protective equipment, including our N95 masks. Um, when we would use those for whenever we needed to maintain respiratory safety on a job when the task right. called for it. So uh, anytime it was sanding, uh, disturbing dust, uh, it was kind of just a matter of course that you'd have, we just referred to as a dust mask, um, right. you know, and of course an N95 dust mask is what you're looking for because it actually blocks out particulate. There's a, as people have learned, there's other lesser forms of um, what would be termed dust mask. Um, okay. We have, um, uh, we've run into issues with uh, the pandemic causing shortages of PPE. So we've seen some shortage of personal protective equipment that's affected our industry. Um, not only N95 masks, but also protective coverings to, uh, mm -hmm. tie, like Tyvek suits, okay. uh, gloves, um, you know, things like that, uh, sanitizer uh, being in shortage. Um, and filters for half face or full face respirators, which again is something that we use um, by the task, uh, which is very okay. important. But we're navigating that. Um, we're unclear if it's gonna become an issue moving forward for our signatory contractors to acquire such uh, equipment. Um, in some cases, we've been able to, uh, through our training department, uh, help our signatories acquire uh, that necessary PPE. Uh, in which they purchase from us and then provide to the to the members to the workers, which is, you know, that's uh, one thing that a lot of people, I think, it has drawn back into focus and sh everyone should be reminded of. It's an employer's responsibility to provide a safe work environment, and we can talk more about that. But one of the main things is to pr the um, providing of personal mm -hmm. protective equipment. Uh, that is the legal responsibility of every employer. Absolutely. We could do a whole another show on that, right? We sure could. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Justin, can you just give me a little bit more information on, I know that on a federal level, you guys have been working on the COVID-19 response of so the stimulus packages. Um, can you talk to me about a little bit about what that work looks like and what you guys are fighting for on that level? Absolutely. Um, you know, the uh, thanks goes out to the Rhode Island Congressional Delegation for everything they've done to uh, help make sure working families are remembered through this pandemic. Uh, the IUPAT internationally across this country has put out a platform that has some very simple steps uh, that we think Congress can take uh, to make sure working families, both in the IUPAT and in general, are taken care of through uh, this uh, pandemic and this time of crisis. And it looks simply like making sure that there are income um, backing, that there's uh, expansion of unemployment, which occurred and needs to be extended. Uh, the ability for healthcare plans uh, to be um, taken care of. Uh, so uh, subsidized COBRA purchases so that working people can uh, stay on their healthcare plan that's tied to their employment with, uh, without it bankrupting themselves and their family. Uh, that there is the ability for defined benefit pension plans to receive loans or funding from the federal government, uh, similar to how large corporations have, whether it be the airline industry, uh, cruise ships, um, mm -hmm. the auto industry in, in 2008, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, one that really is a no-brainer and, and that we're shocked has not occurred um, up to this point, which is a widespread infrastructure package. Mm -hmm. uh, so that people have the ability to go back to work at good paying jobs while we fix this country. Um, so that looks like everything from hospitals and schools, the roads and bridges, uh, broadband internet, all of that. We, we need to see a major investment in infrastructure in this country. 
Um, and uh, the federal government uh, needs to act on that. And those things would uh, go a long way to making sure that uh, working families in the IUPAT and otherwise are taken care of. A lot of discussion right now of the Trump administration using a, a sadistic tactic, which mm -hmm. is to deny people the choice to return to work for a greater good of the economy, supposedly, but really for the profit margins of some very large corporations and for um, the alchemy of the stock market. Uh, you're not free if your choice is between survival or putting yourself and your family at risk of death. That's not a choice and that's not freedom and that's a right. fundamental problem. But the reality is, is that we need this to continue. There can't be a choice between do I kill my grandmother because I live with her and she has a pre-existing condition and I have to go back to work? Or, you know, um, do I starve and have to look for work at lesser wages or uh, benefits? Right. So that unemployment insurance, making sure that there's income security. I actually firmly think of my personal beliefs that there should be um, some sort of form of uh, introductory, introductory universal basic income implemented during this. Right. Uh, look to Canada. Uh, and I think Senator uh, Sanders, Senator Markey, and some other um, senatorial leaders, congressional leaders have introduced legislation that would give every working person $2,000 a month uh, to mm -hmm. live off of, you know, um, and that's needed. I think that we need something like that. Um, you know, and there's also been discussion about, well, people won't go back to work if they have unemployment insurance. To me and to us, that says one thing very clearly you don't pay your workers enough. <laughs> if you don't pay someone enough when they go to work that a $600 additional benefit weekly for unemployment insurance is going to make it more lucrative for them to stay home, you don't have a sustainable business model right. because you don't pay people enough to, to survive, basically. Absolutely. Um, you know. So some of the other specifics that we have asked con uh, Congress to, to look and to remember working families uh, and to look at are... Um, things that look very similar to the uh, income piece. Um, so healthcare, uh, our healthcare is tied to our employment in this country, right? Um, it looks like uh, with Bernie Sanders not winning the nomination, we're gonna continue to have an employment system that's tied, uh, a healthcare system rather that's tied to your employment. Um, the building construction trades are uh, no different. Uh, the IEPAT is no different. My district councils, uh, system works that when you work hours, those hours go into a system, the contractor paid that bill, uh, and then uh, you have healthcare coverage. But if you don't keep working, your healthcare gets suspended. You build up a little cushion, but most of the time it's not too big. Mm -hmm. And so what happens then if you haven't had work hours and you have no contributions going in, uh, your healthcare coverage stops. You get, get offered uh, to purchase COBRA which uh, can be fine if you have had a really good year and there's a small gap in your service mm -hmm. uh, to purchase COBRA, but in the middle of a pandemic uh, and when there's extended unemployment or potentials for extended unemployment, COBRA can be out of reach. So what does that mean? That means that people then have no health care or the, if they're lucky enough, uh, they can apply for subsidized state health care mm -hmm. um, uh, through the ACA. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is that most people are not eligible for that, won't be able to do that. And so what we've asked Congress to do is to offer um, a bailout of COBRA funds and to offer a subsidy so that when people have to purchase COBRA to maintain their health care coverage, uh, that can be done at no cost to themselves or their families. Okay. And uh, I think that's something that would make a lot of sense, um, that there's the ability of, of working families to buy into their plan and that they get federal money to help do that, right? right? That the government is here to protect working people and working families, citizens of this country, not corporate interests and the 1%. Absolutely. Uh, another thing is, you know, the other big challenge of working people, which is what do you do when you get old? You can't work in construction your entire life. You can't work for your entire life, period, right? But when you work in an industry that beats your body up, uh, you have to retire. And so we have great pension plans, great defined contribution plans, annuities throughout the trades. Uh, but those pension plans have taken a huge hit uh, over the years. And we've seen a corporate assault on working people's rights and working families, uh, deliberate attempt to bust unions across this country. 
uh, and that's taken its toll. And then you add in 2008 and the economic collapse, and our pension systems took a huge hit, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of the stock market collapsing and in terms of the uh, work hours going down for our pension. So what we're looking for is the same as what other large entities have been offered by the federal government, which is the ability to receive loans and grants to bail out a pension system and not see a massive cascading effect uh, that will occur across the country and seeing all these defined benefit plans belly up. Um, there's some bad proposals out there and there's some good ones. Uh, the IUPAT fully supports the Butch Lewis Act. Uh, it's an act that's put forward that would create the ability for uh, these defined benefit plans, not only the IUPAT and the other building trades, but of other industries and other unions uh, to be able to access the necessary capital in a way that would belly these plans so that we know that you don't have to have a choice between working till the grave as a retirement right. plan or being homeless, or maybe you eat Alpo instead of uh, you know, having a heat on uh, yeah. in the most wealthy country that's ever existed in the entirety of the human species. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. No, I just want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about on a federal, I mean, on a local level, as work sites and job sites uh, continue to open up or as they start opening up, um, what are some of your concerns that you have for your members? But also it'll be a double question because not only for your members, but how are those concerns increased for those non-represented uh, workers on those job sites? Sure, yeah, I mean, it looks different um, in both regards. Uh, I have a little bit of personal concern as the economy opens up, it adds in exponential vector points for infection. Uh, and so where there was a limited uh, you know, exposure uh, with other industries not operating and people under a stay-at-home order, uh, mm -hmm. it, we f I felt more confident that our workers could maintain safety on site. And I still think we can do that, but I think it's going to be more challenging as you just add in more vector points. But we trust the governor's response mm -hmm. uh, and the tracing, the uh, contact tracing that they have in place um, and the phased uh, slow opening. Um, we know that Governor Armando is doing uh, probably one of the best jobs in the whole country in this response. So um, that's a great thing. But, you know, you look at nearby Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and, you know, we've got some major hotspots going on. And, um, you know, it does get concerning as you add in vector points, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, what we've done on every site um, is that we have every contractor and every general contractor, every construction site has a, a COVID uh, site management plan. And um, we'll get you some information on the IUPAT's model COVID site management plans. Uh, but it looks like basic stuff, right? Uh, monitoring. Every site has, uh, should have, or, or does have, uh, a medical professional or an assigned COVID officer that takes the temperature of every employee before they start work, uh, asks them uh, if they've had any symptoms, uh, and then if anybody is exhibiting any symptoms or does uh, have a temperature, they're sent home. Mm -hmm. um, the site sanitation is another huge piece. Um, every reputable general contractor, uh, every union general contractor that we know of is uh, currently employing uh, somebody to engage in site sanitation. So wiping down high touch areas. Uh, in some cases, we had site closures and then uh, companies come in and perform uh, very high level decontamination procedures mm -hmm. uh, before work resumed. Um, and social distancing is uh, another piece, uh, absolutely non-negotiable. Uh, to have an open site, you have to maintain social distancing wherever possible. There's times where you can't do that. You know, you can't lift an object by yourself, so you need two people and you're gonna be closer than six feet. That's mm -hmm. where personal protective equipment comes in. Um, I have one painted contractor working on a very large site uh, that it currently is telling all members, and we're in full support of this, that they need to be in their half-face respirator, or full-face respirator the entirety of their shift, um, with the exception of breaks where they're off out of the building uh, to take their break. Okay. Um, you know, soap and water on site. These things are uh, non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. However, the concern lies really with non-union sites yeah. and the unrepresented workforce that works there. You know, to be clear, most people want to be in the union. Most people want to, you know, that are in the industry want to be, 
you know, in the IUPAT or one of the other building trades unions, mm -hmm. most people want union representation. We have a broken system of labor law uh, that makes it very difficult for people to gain that representation. That's again, a whole other episode. Yeah. Uh, the reality is though, is that before the pandemic, health and safety laws, labor laws, uh, these things weren't followed by um, non-union contractors, bad actors. There's some that do, you know, you, don't get me wrong, there's some good uh, folks out there that um, don't have a union contract, but do the right thing for whatever reason. Uh, but there's quite a few that don't. And if they didn't follow health and safety laws before a pandemic, which changed that suddenly now they're going to. Right. So we have a real concern and uh, we look forward to uh, you know, as the stay at home orders are lifted, we look forward to working with the state and the state's enforcement arms uh, and making sure that workers have what they need on site. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that all those things, site monitoring, social distancing, uh, PPE, site sanitation, that all these things are being followed. And uh, if they're not being followed on site, they should be shut down until those are put in place. Mm -hmm. and, Hopefully that's going to be something that um, the state has the authority to do and uh, that we can work in conjunction with state inspectors to ensure that everybody has opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, like everything else, it, it relies on somebody advocating for their rights, right? And so I would fully encourage anybody out there who's seeing this, hearing this, that doesn't have union representation, that wants union representation, or maybe, hey, you just want to make sure that your site is safe to work on mm -hmm. uh, to contact us. And you can do that very easily through a website, which is just simply buildingtradesri.com. And at that website, there's some easy to find contact uh, uh, links and uh, reach out, reach out. And I, I guarantee you, somebody will be back in touch with you. Mm -hmm. And whether that you want to go through the process of forming a union on the job, or you simply want to make sure that, uh, you know, they clean the portage on that hasn't been cleaned in a month mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, that, um, you know, there's hand sanitizer and soap and water on your site right. because these are things that don't exist on construction sites a lot of times mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, just industry practice, the machismo that goes with the industry a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, who, who needs that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but in a pandemic, it's the difference between life and death. maybe. Absolutely. And just to clarify too, on the non-union work sites, there is no COVID site manager or co uh, specialist. There's no actual safety regulations in place. That's only on the union sites or? So we know for a fact that on union sites there are. Okay. I don't know for a fact on non-union sites. It's not because, mandatory on those sites. Right. Place. right. There's, no, there's no law that says mm -hmm. that you have to have it. Yeah. We're hoping that the governor's uh, going to take action around this to ensure that there is that yeah. there's some kind of executive order that says uh if you don't have these things in place your site will not continue to work um uh, because sense. that's the frightening reality you know i could walk you before the pandemic i could walk you into any number of mills being renovated across the state where again health and safety laws were not followed um uh, sandblasting occurs with uh without the proper precautions and procedures so the workers their families the surrounding community are all put at risk of uh hazards yeah um, I can show you uh, mills being renovated where there was open holes in the floor uh, and people could fall through them or fall, put a, a foot or a leg through it and, and have yeah. a severe injury. Um, no one was forcing these people to follow the law previous to this, let alone all of the labor laws that are being violated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, the DLT does go out and enforce the law on these, on these projects. But again, we have a system that's set up to avoid culpability for the people that really need it, which is the developers and general contractors, mm -hmm. um, which goes into a whole nother segment on the underground economy and employee misclassification, which we've talked about before. I'm sure yeah. we'll talk about it again, but. Um, yeah. Thank you. And yeah. I know that you were just, you were talking about this with me last week um, at a, on a local level. Um, you had mentioned that there are some social partnerships that um, you might be able to unpack a little bit. Um, on a local level, how those partnerships can be made better, uh, what we can do around those. Sure, you know, this is one thing that has always been in my mind and, and to some extent bothered me as somebody that came from a background of social justice activism 
um, at the same time that I was a tradesman. Before I was in the union, I come from a family of tradesmen, but I, I became a, you know, an activist and an organizer around social justice issues, mm -hmm. uh, kind of concurrently as working in the trade before I became a member of the union and uh, union leadership. So it's always bothered me that a lot of people in this milieu um, talk a big game about social justice, and a lot of them do a lot of good work. Uh, but when it comes to the construction practices, whether it's renovation or construction, new construction, uh, they forget about that. They forget about those values seemingly, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they don't do anything to ensure that they're procuring union labor, um, which I think is absolutely should be a no-brainer uh, for mm -hmm. any nonprofit that really wants to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to supporting working people and working families. Uh, they should use union construction labor. Um, that said, if you know you don't want to make that guarantee, uh, you should at least guarantee that you're not using people who are engaged in the underground economy and the hyper exploitation of workers that that brings. Um, you know, we've seen uh, grocery stores on Cranston Street in Providence, uh, that's a, a consumer co-op, uh, use non-union labor that engages the underground economy. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen um, uh, groups that bring uh, fresh food uh, uh, to, to neighborhoods uh, and engage in advocacy around food access um, and restaurants um, uh, use non-union labor. Uh, right around the corner from our pre-apprenticeship program, Building Futures. Um, and again, uh, seemingly engaging in, in the underground economy because of a, a selection of a contractor that's disreputable, uh, who has had issues in the past and then doesn't care about what kind of subcontractors they line up. Uh, so they just line up misclassified employees to do the work. Um, that creates a huge problem. Um, you know, and then look at, there's other other groups that really, you know, uh, we would hope could do better. Universities, public and private, um, uh, uh, hospital systems. Uh, mm -hmm. I know it's a tough time for them, but in general, uh, you know, talk a lot about social partnership, but then don't follow through with their, you know, renovation and construction procedures. So we would hope that people uh, would be open to having these conversations mm -hmm. uh, about how they could do better, uh, how we could all do better and, and help each other and make sure that there was a virtuous cycle uh, where local people who are paid a living wage and make good benefits uh, are hired to do the work that they need done in their buildings. Absolutely. Um, you know, and if you got to have an additional fundraiser to do that, um, hey, that's great. You hit us up. We'll gladly donate to make sure that you have uh, a little extra uh, so that you can do the right thing when it comes to renovation and construction. Right. Absolutely. And uh, before we close, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to share anything that you, any information that you may have, um, how individuals can get involved, um, or how some businesses can be doing, making concrete strides to be doing the right thing, to be centering workers. Um, what would you say? Um, you know, if you're a working person and you want union representation, you have the legal right to form a union and engage in what's called concerted activity to better your workplace. And uh, reach out, reach out. It, it, organizers from all different unions, myself included, are accessible. Uh, that website, buildingtradesri.com, is a great place to go to get more information about the unionized construction industry. Mm -hmm. It also has listing of contractors. Uh, we have a labor management group called Build RI, which will gladly work with any end user, any entity, whether it be a public entity, a private entity, nonprofit or for-profit, to help you line up uh, um, engaging unionized uh, workforce and using union contractors for your project. But those things are easy. It's easy. It's simple as a, a, um, an email or a phone call. Yeah. And, uh, and we can make it work. We have ways to um, work with people's budgetary constraints even. Um, but it really is the difference between engaging in a virtuous cycle uh, or of working people being treated well, tax dollars going back into the economy locally, or um, a bad negative feedback cycle of workers being exploited, uh, cheap as possible contractor, out of town labor, um, people being victimized on if they're an undocumented immigrant, have substance abuse problems, are previously incarcerated. Those are the type of people that you see being taken advantage of on union uh, aspect of the construction industry. Right. Well, thank you so much for being on Labor Vision. I want to thank um, oh. both you, the uh, the union, uh, IUPAT, as well as all of your members for the work that you guys continue to do amidst the crisis. Um, and thanks for taking time out of your day to be on the show.
Yeah, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person sometime and hopefully the relative future. Jerica. Yeah, thank ho you. hopefully. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you to all of our viewers. You're watching Labor Vision. Thanks so much for tuning in and be safe. And we hope to see you back here next week. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.